Okay, sequencing. This is from Eric. Help us learn this mysterious and dying art. I get it. I totally agree with you on that. I'm about to start a business in which I'll be doing a lot of, a lot as each of my clients will get a magazine of the shoot. Great idea, Eric. I know I know what you're talking about now. We've, we've emailed about this. I know time and other great photo books will do, but I'd like to see a walkthrough of great photo book of one of yours since you know why you did what you did with the sequencing. I would never put my name and great photo book in the same sentence. I might put my name and interestingly flawed photo book in the same sentence, but I get where you're going. Um, and I will do this. I have one book in particular that is a book about, uh, a f I think I worked on it for four years. It was a project in Sicily about religion. It was during Easter in Sicily. They have these amazing processions. I started going there in the late nineties. I think I made four trips to Sicily, but anyway, there's about 50 pictures in the overall take. And I once used those at a portfolio review. They were, they were static prints, so a box filled, and the, you open the box, and the first print had the title and the subtitle. And then you flipped over the print, and then it was an explanation of what the project was about, which was about religion in Sicily. And then you flipped over and you started through the photos. And I thought I'd sequenced these masterfully. And I was showing them at a portfolio review. And I was showing them to a very, very highbrow photo editor who looked and I realized very quickly had not paid attention to the title of the story or the subtitle or had read any of the explanation of what it was. And one of the first pictures in the, in the box was of uh, Sicilian Catholics wearing hoods that were participating in a religious procession. It had nothing to do with the kind of people who wear hoods in America, if you know what I mean. But the photo editor wasn't paying attention and she saw the image and immediately got offended and slammed the book in my face and refused to look at it and stormed off. And yes, you could, I could take offense at that from, from her perspective because she did not pay attention and she was acting kind of like spoiled. However, I took it as my fault because I led too soon with the wrong photograph. It was a strong photo. I really think it was a strong photo. I think it was one of the best photos I made. I realized that I had not given enough of the story before I gave that photograph and it killed it and it blew up in my face. And so again, yes, I could fault her for not paying attention, but also it's my fault too. And that's the beauty of a sequence. It is a roller coaster. When you get on a roller coaster, they very rarely hit you with the drop right off the bat. They antagonize you, they terrorize you, and then they hit you with the drop. So that's what a good sequence will do. And I'm no expert on it. Um, I, I know I, I know of people and I've worked with people who are master, what I would call master editors and also master sequencers and book designers. And when you work with them, you get a whole nother level of respect for people who spend their lives doing that. All right, next question, we are moving along. <clears throat> hey Daniel, it'd be great if you could talk about how to promote selling prints or a magazine, especially through social media like Instagram. John, I'm sorry, I don't really have a lot of information about that. I think everyone else would because pretty much every single human being I know seems to spend a in just enormous amount of time on Instagram. And I have not had an account for a long time. So I don't really know. I'm sure it's possible and people are doing it all the time. I still would prefer my own site. Um, I do think someone like Craig Mod in Japan is a great person to look at. And I'm sure he is on Instagram. I don't know how it, it works into his system of delivery or marketing but I'm not the right person to ask because I just don't wanna be around those networks. Okay, I have a lot of basic questions about printing postcards. You've mentioned postcards and I don't know if I've missed an instructional film, but a walkthrough would be helpful. Christian, so I love postcards too. I love getting them in the mail. I love sending them, I always have. I can remember going back to my first days of traveling abroad and sending postcards from remote places in the world and it taking like, I'd be back from the trip by a month before they'd, they'd show up kind of thing. So I don't have anything high tech in particular. The one thing I would suggest is that I use a paper from a company called Hanamule and Hanamule or Hanamula, depending on how you pronounce it. I don't really know if that's how you pronounce it, but I think you'll find it based on my excellent pronunciation. And Hanamule makes postcard paper that comes in a metal tin. And I should have brought one. I have like four tins of these in the house. And they're, the paper's beautiful. It's coated. It's got a little tooth to it. It's beautiful. And I do not use a fancy printer. I have a horrible all-in-one scanner, printer, whatever, that is not good. And it's really old. I can't believe it still works. And I buy like third-party black market ink where sometimes the yellow ink could be blue. You just don't know, right? It's not a great system, but that's what I use to print my postcards and it works and it's super inexpensive and it, and it, and it looks great. I do have a Canon Pro 1000 printer that I just turned on the other day. I hadn't turned it on since I moved to New Mexico, which is yeesh, last summer sometime. 
Uh, I thought it would never work and it did. And I will probably start making some larger prints at some point in the near future. But postcards are just get that Hanamula paper and use whatever printer you have and people will flip out when you send them these things. Hey Dan, having followed your earlier advice, uh-oh, Phil, that was probably not a good idea. I really value the testing approach with different styles, fonts, layouts, papers, and color accuracy. I did this with MagCloud and learned heaps. Are you Australian? Australians love that word, heaps. I like it too, but I like everything Australian and I like everything Canadian. So, um, and if either of those countries are looking for a creative evangelist for a company based in one of those countries, I am all ears, baby. Uh, okay, so let me get back to this, Phil. Uh, so recommend talking to this point again as part of the process. I think your, your question here is primarily about testing. And yes, I am 100% into testing. I'm getting ready to do another YouTube film that my, the series that I already have called Notes on Photography. I have another tack on that, which is called Notes on Layouts. And I think it's applicable and it's good because I don't have any training in page design, right? I studied photojournalism. We did one design class. I had to design a cover for The Last of the Mohicans with a T-square and tracing paper and press on type. So go look that stuff up. Go, go to the museum and look that stuff up. That was the only design I had. By the way, my cover of Last of the Mohicans was awesome. Imagine a grid pattern with boxes all empty except for the last one. Had a little Mohican like silhouette illustration of a, of a uh, Mohican Native American in there. That was my take on Last of the Mohicans, which by the way is a great book and a, and a really good movie too. Anyway, testing is absolutely key. And one of the things that I do, which I'm gonna make the film about, is that I will sometimes often just look at a single photograph. And the first example I'm gonna do is an image from Paris. And I look at it and I just think to myself, how would I build a layout around that photo? And I open Blurb Book right, and I just start to play. And I do typically do three takes on that image on one spread. So right page, left page, or depending on your point of view. I use copy, varying sizes of copy, sometimes captions, titles, subtitles. And I just give myself a challenge. And often what I'll do is I'll go back to the eight, 70s or 80s or 90s. I'll look at things like fashion magazines. And I'll look at some of the design techniques they had, and then I'll co-opt them into the modern era, and I will just start to play. So I'll take sort of my own photojournalism style sensibility, I'll blend it with an 80s fashion idea, and I just mock up layouts, and then I save those layouts. I'll often do just a screen grab and save them into a folder so that if I get stuck on a project, I can often go back to those spreads and say, oh, this gives me an idea to move in a direction. Hopefully that helps. Not to blow my own horn, I think that was a really good piece of information I just gave you. You know how long it took me to figure out how to do that? A long time. And now I do it all the time. I'm a giver. I'm a giver, people. Okay, this is from S-H-Y-A-M-A-L, Shymal, Shamal. Okay, I hope I got remotely close. I've taken up several long-term projects with the goal of print as the final output. However, I find myself constantly evolving and the images taken at the latter part do not resemble in quality or characteristics to the photo shot during the initial phase of the project. How does one overcome this and create a cohesive body of work? On one side, I'm happy, I'm constantly learning and getting better. However, it does not help for a final output. First of all, that was a very well-written question. Let me just tip my hat to you in doing so. Very well-written and a great question. It is a dilemma and I'm not really sure what the solution is. I did a project once or started it, a project on all the towns in America called Paradise. There are 12 of them in 12 different states. And I shot the first five. I got in my old four by four and I drove around sleeping in the back of my truck um, doing five of these towns. And I realized at the end of the fifth town that my work was simply not good enough, that I needed to start over. I decided to shoot that project with a Pentax 645. I don't know why I did that. That was a, a very poor choice of camera for that project. It was sort of a tweener camera. So it is medium format, but and it's somewhat nimble, but the autofocus is slow and it's kind of limiting and the lenses were okay, but not really, I loved the camera, don't get me wrong, but it didn't work for that project. And I had a tough decision to make. I looked at the project and said, this is not good enough. And other people were telling me, you're out of your mind, you're out of your mind, this is a great start, keep going, keep going. And I knew deep down inside, if I felt that way about it already, I was gonna have to start over. So my point to you is you may not be necessarily want to start over or have the capability to start over. So what you can think about doing is maybe doing separate books. You could do chapters, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, and use that work from the first and show it and build it 
or you make tough decisions and you just say, I'm either gonna reshoot what I did initially or I'm gonna cut what I did initially. The good news is you're improving as a photographer. That's a serious deal. So again, the positive outweighs the negative. Best of luck. How long have we been going here? I'm going a long time. My phone's texting. That's another thing that drives me nuts. Everybody text, 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 text. Hi, Dan. I've heard you talk about printing essays, even if it's just practice. Well, I want to do that with thousands of pictures I have on my hard drive. Any tips on creating a journal after without having the journal in mind when taking the photos, even if it's just for practice? Unfortunately, my three-week road trip got canceled. Was looking forward to this one in an essay. Thanks, watching from Germany. I love Germany. I've only been there twice, I think, but I had a great time both times. I really like it there. Let me think about this. I had three major trips canceled between now and the end of the year. Two were business-related trips, and they're all gone. They're dead. They're not happening, which, again, I'm totally fine with. I think we have to think of our culture as a collective now, not as individuals. And if I have to sit put here in the van in the driveway, I will do so. So I hope that things are going better for, for everyone in Germany. So a couple of things here. The journal is can be a tricky, tricky, tricky thing to start. And, and I just spoke about this on, a, on a, another Q&A film I just did. Oftentimes, so much of what we do as photographers is intended for an audience, right? It's intended for a print audience or you know, you're on assignment and you're shooting for somebody specific or it's the internet and you want praise, you want likes and subs and all these different things. All of a sudden you're dealing with something like this journal, a print piece that isn't for anyone except you. And oftentimes that can be staggeringly challenging to look at something and go, oh my God, this is all me. It's a blank canvas. There's no reward on the end of this. There's no direct reward. So I don't think there's a wrong way of doing this. I think you could literally just start making small prints and pasting them in, or you could start by writing. I like stream of consciousness writing where you give your, put yourself on a clock and just say, I'm gonna write for 90 seconds and I'm gonna write whatever comes into my head. No one else is ever gonna see this. I'm never gonna be judged. It's never gonna be financially related. No one's gonna give me a like or a sub or anything. And you just start and you start putting it in there. There's no right or wrong. You don't have to start at the first page of the journal. You can start in the middle, you can start in the back, you can jump around, there are no rules. How many things in life come with no rules? Not many, so take advantage of it. There's no, no, uh, no wrong way to get from A to B with a journal. All right, I'm gonna stop this and start it again because I'm paranoid. You know, it's kind of risky doing this in the van because I haven't done anything in the van for quite some time, at least film related. And I'm just sitting here and wondering, I'm doing the a formula, a deep, deep mathematical formula in my head about the odds of this being in focus. And I'm thinking it's about 48%, which was about like my average score in math through my entire life. Okay, what kinds of photos benefit from the various textures of paper, i.e. close-up portraits on a textured paper, cars on a premium gloss, etc.? This is from Zen. Zen, I think I'll go back to what I'd said earlier about testing and about the subjectivity of paper. It's really hard for me to give you uh, specifics because it is such a, a, a personal thing. But I will tell you this. When I started using Blurb, I, in my head, I was shooting two things commercially at the time. I was still a full-time photographer. I was shooting reportage and I was shooting portraiture. And when I looked at the offerings at Blurb, I was in a hurry and I thought I was an expert and I was like, I don't need a swatch kit and I can figure this out. And I thought for sure that I would print my reportage on uncoated stock and my portraiture on the coated stock. And then I made a book. And I realized about a second and a half after opening the book that I had made the wrong decision. It should have been the opposite way. The reportage should have been on coated paper and the portraiture on uncoated. Not to mention, I should have opened up my portraits about a third to a half a stop because that was the look that I needed. And in, and in my rush, I forgot to test. I was, I was sort of arrogant in the sense that I'd been printing since the early 90s. I'd been making small books since the early 90s. And I just thought, oh, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to do this. And I didn't. And I just made it the opposite decision. I just made that one mistake. And since that time, I've carried on in those traditions because it took a little bit of testing. One was not better. The portraits I wanted were lighter, brighter, and the coating of the paper, I didn't necessarily need super dark blacks. My reportage is about darkness, contrast, and grain. I'm not looking for grayscale. I don't want shadow detail. I need a paper that holds a lot of ink that has a super deep black, and the coated paper was my solution for that.